Well, thank you so much, Dr. Aiken. What a joy it is to be at Southeastern Seminary. Uh, I've been here several times. It's always a joy to come to this school. I love your president, Dr. Aiken. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was sitting there watching him when he's making those announcements, and I thought, I hope when I get that old, I can be that good. Uh, <laughs> I just love old people. I don't know why I do. <laughs> you know, I always get intimidated when I preach in seminaries. Uh, there's so many of these uh, gifted scholars who know the Hebrew and Greek, and all of you students who are making straight A's, and it just makes me nervous to stand before a crowd like this and make you listen to Elmer Fudd from Alabama. <laughs> And I want to be sure that I'll get my facts exactly right. I want to be careful that I know what I'm saying. <clears throat> Reminds me of a young seminary student who just graduated. I'm sure he wasn't from uh, Southeastern. And I hope he wasn't from New Orleans where I graduated. So we'll just say he's from Southern. But he was being interviewed for his first church. He'd never pastored a church. And so the chairman of the committee said, Son, you know much about the Bible? He said, I sure do. I'm a seminary graduate. I know it all. He said, Well, what part do you know best? He said, I know it all. I know the Old Testament, the New Testament. And the fellow said, Well, if you know so much about the Bible, why don't you just tell us one of the stories that you know? For instance, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know that story? He said, I know it well. He said, well, tell us that story. He said, well, there was a man of the Pharisees who was named Nicodemus who went down to Jerusalem by night and he fell upon stony ground and the thorns choked him after death. <laughs> and he said, what shall I do? For I have no room to bestow all my fruits. I will arise and go to my father's house. And he arose and climbed up into a sycamore tree. <laughs> the next day, the three wise men came and carried him down to the ark for Moses to take care of him. But as he was walking into the eastern gate to the ark, he caught his hair in a limb. And he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> and he was afterward hungered, and the ravens came and fed him. The next day, Solomon and his wife, Gomorrah, came by and carried him down to Nineveh, and they found Delilah sitting on the wall. And they said, chunk her down, boys. And they said, well, how many times shall we chunk her down? Till seven times? He said, nay, but until 70 times seven, and they chunked her down 490 times. And she burst asunder in their midst. And they picked up 12 baskets of the fragments which were made. And in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And the chairman of the deacon said, Fellows, I think we need to call him. He's young, but he really knows his Bible. And I hope you really know your Bible. I want you to open the Bible if you brought one with you to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and I want to begin reading with verse number 5. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 5. A sower went out to sow the seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and it, as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said unto you, It is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. 
Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. In those short seven verses, they seem to divide themselves into four very obvious segments. First, there is the seed. Now, thankfully, Jesus did something when he told this parable that he did not always do. He explained the parable. Aren't you grateful that Jesus explained that parable to us? If he had not given us an explanation of what that parable meant, only heaven knows what kind of interpretations we would have given to it. But he specifically says that the word is the seed. So the word of God divides itself in the seed. Second, there is the sower. There was somebody that had the responsibility of scattering or sowing that seed. Now that could be any one of us that speaks or sings or teaches or passes out a gospel track. Anybody that has the responsibility or concern of sharing the seed of the Word of God is described as a sower. Third, there was the soils. I find it very intriguing that those seed fell into different kinds of soils. And that within itself is a wonderful lesson that we do well to understand that not all seeds fall in the right place. But now there's a fourth thing, and it's one I want to isolate for you today, and we sometimes don't see it very clear, clear, clearly. Not only is there the seed, the sower, the soils, but there is Satan's strategy. Now look what it says. It says that those seed that fell by the wayside and were devoured, he said that represents Satan who comes and takes away the seed, lest they believe and be saved. So I want you to get this in your eyes very clearly, because it's what I want to talk to you about today. Here's a man with a bag of seed in his hand, and he's going out, scattering that seed, and in the background, the devil is watching that scene unfold. And when that man throws those seed in a particular place, the Bible says that the devil rushes forward and takes away that seed. Why? Lest they believe and be saved. You see, my young student friends, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the devil knows that unless he removes that seed from the one who has heard it, they may believe and be saved. That's what he said. Lest they believe and lest they be saved. So the devil watches that and he moves immediately to take that seed out of the heart of the one who has heard it. Now that's what the Bible says he does. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever stopped to think what the devil does? that the Bible doesn't tell us about. If you were the devil and you were watching that scene unfold and you knew that if you didn't get that word out of the heart of that person who heard it, they might get saved, you'd try to move that seed out of their heart. But you also understand that it's a lot harder to remove the seed from the heart of the one who heard it than it is to take it out of the hand of the one who holds it. And so the devil looks at that scene and his wise ingenuity, if possible, the devil will do all he can to take the seed out of the hand of the one who holds it. And my dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you emphatically as I know how to tell you, the devil is always about everywhere at all times trying to take the seed from the hand of the one who holds it lest we scatter it as God commanded. Now how is he going to do that? How is the devil going to take that seed out of your hand and my hand so that we do not sow it and if we do not sow it they will not hear and Paul says they will not hear except someone preach to them. How is he going to do that? Well I want to show you three or four simple little ways and they're not very profound but they are interestingly and true. First of all, the devil does that by intimidation. 
You see, the devil's trick is to intimidate those that hold the seed so that we will not sow that seed because of his intimidation. Jesus uh, shared a little bit about that when he told his disciples these interesting words. The world will hate you, and they will hate you as they hated me. If you were of the world, the world would not love his own. But the, because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. And if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Charles Spurgeon put it well when he wrote these words. Slander is seldom short of expression. It prates and prattles evermore. Neither David nor our Lord nor any of his saints were allowed to escape the attacks of venomous tongues. This is a thrice told story and to the end of time it will be true. Now listen. He that is born after the flesh will persecute that which is born after the Spirit. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I want to say to you as emphatically as I know how to say it, you're going out into a culture that does not like you. As a matter of fact, many of them will hate you. When I first started preaching, I'd never been to church, knew nothing about God or church or religious matters. I'd never been inside the walls of a church till I was nearly 13 years old. All I knew about a preacher was that he had a beautiful suit and drove a nice car. And Brother Danny, when God called me to be a preacher, I thought everybody's going to love me. They're going to think I hung the moon. It didn't take me but a few weeks to realize they not only didn't think I hung the moon, many of them wished I was on the moon. <laughs> now, folks, let me tell you something. You're not going to be very popular in the culture in which we live today. Not everybody's going to like you. That has always been true, as Jesus said it would be true, but it has been intensified in the day in which we live. We're increasingly living in a culture that is anti-God and anti-Christ, and anybody who dares to speak the Word of God will immediately be castigated as intolerant, ignorant, and biased. Listen to what uh, David Samuels, an editor for the New York Times, recently wrote. The New York Times is arguably the most influential newspaper in America. That's what the New York Times thinks. <laughs> but listen to what David Samuels, the editor of the New York Times, wrote. It is a shared, if unspoken, premise of the world that most of us inhabit. He's talking about his secular crowd. That absolutes do not exist and that people who claim to have found them are crazy. Now that's what the New York Times says about Dr. Daniel Aiken. That's what they say about Junior Hill. And that's what they'll say about you. You're crazy. And when you stand in a pulpit and dare to open the Bible and to say, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, honor thy father and thy mother, if you dare to take that unapologetically stand for the truth of God, mark it well that you will be viewed as intolerant, bigoted, narrow-minded, and they will silence you by intimidation, if at all possible. And that's exactly what's happened, pastors. Many have been intimidated because of the applause of the world and they've ceased to declare the truth of the Word of God. I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest with me. What if the time comes when you're told that you can no longer preach the moral absolutes of the Word of God? What will be your reaction to that? How will you stand when you're told that you cannot stand. What are you going to do when the Supreme Court rules, as they likely will rule, that you must marry homosexual couples? How will you stand? What will be your idea of the truth of the Word of God? Will you stand or will you be intimidated into silence? Dr. Danny, I've been telling young preachers where I've preached in the past few weeks and months, and I, I hope I'm wrong. You know, sometimes you preach things that you think will happen, but you hope they won't happen. 
And I hope I'm wrong about this. But I want to make you this prediction. I predict to you today that unless there is a radical alteration of the culture in which you and I now find ourselves, many of you men and perhaps women in this building who dare to preach the truth of God are going to end up in jail. You say, now, Brother Jim, you're talking about America, the home of the brave and the free. That's right. But I'm telling you that the culture is tightening the noose around those that preach the gospel, and the days ahead are going to be difficult and dark for you young men and women who are going out to serve. And don't let the devil intimidate you. I say to you, if all hell freezes over and they call you every name in the book, stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, word of God, and say what God told you to say. Don't let the world take away your seed by intimidation. But sometimes the devil takes away the seed by observation. You say, now, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? Observation. Well, let me read you what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. It's a very intriguing little passage of Scripture. Listen to what, what he said. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all, now listen to what he said. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand. Now why? For thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Now what in the world is he saying? Well, here's what he's saying. He is saying that that sower who has that bag of seed in his hand must never be intimidated by what he sees. He that observeth the clouds or looks at the rain will not sow. You must not be intimidated about what you see. But he takes it a little step further. You must not be intimidated about what you understand. Now follow me very close. Let me show you a very interesting thing about that little scripture. As you read it, here it seems what he's saying. Here is a man with a bag of seed in his hands. Now he has one or two choices that he can do. He can disregard the clouds, pay no attention to the winds or the rain, and sow those seeds. Or he can look at those seeds and pour them out in his hands and observe and evaluate all of those seeds. That one looks a little puny. That one has some rough edges to it. That one looks a little bit anemic. I don't think that one will grow, but these probably will. And he can stand there observing and evaluating those seeds, and then he puts in the ground the one he thinks will come up. That's what he can do. Or he can do what God plainly told us to do. He can sow every one of those seeds and let the sovereign God of the universe determine which one will come out. You see, my dear brother, God has not called you to evaluate the success of the seed. He's called you to sow the seed and to scatter the seed, and that's your responsibility. It's not your business to spend all your life evaluating who will respond and not respond to the gospel. That's not your business. It's your business to proclaim the gospel and let the God of heaven decide who will hear and who will not hear. I may be wrong about this. I've been wrong once or twice. I can't remember when it was, but I have been wrong once or twice. <laughs> but Dr. Danny, I believe that we're heavily tilted toward an excessive evaluation in our culture today. And we have a generation of men and women that are frantically rushing from pillar to post trying to decide who will respond to the gospel. And our evaluation and our observation has kept us from our proclamation. And we ought to just stand up and preach and let God be the author of who will come out. I had that happen to me some time ago. I was uh, invited by a little church outside of where I lived to preach a Friday night harvest day, they called it. I got there on a Friday night. Now, Friday night is football in Alabama. That may not be up here where y'all don't play football, but in Alabama. 
Oh, I'm ashamed I said that. <laughs> but in Alabama, Friday nights is a big deal. And my home school was in the playoffs. And this guy called me and said, Brother Junior, would you come preach on Friday night? We're going to have a harvest night. I knew better than to accept that. I knew it was a Friday night ball game. And I didn't want to go, to be honest with you. But I said, well, yes, sir, I'll go. The night came, and I drove out there, drove up in the parking lot. There was hardly anybody there. Walked in, sat down on the front pew, hardly anybody. I suspect might have been 15, 20 people there. Nobody spoke to me. Nobody welcomed me. Nobody said, we're glad to have you. And finally, a guy walked down to the front and said, uh, who are you, sir? I said, well, I'm, I'm Junior Hill. I'm going to preach here tonight. He didn't seem to know that, so it didn't, didn't matter. He said, well, Brother Hill, I hate to tell you this, but uh, our pastor had some little difficulty several weeks ago, and he's resigned, and he won't be here. He didn't bother to tell me that. pastor never called me and told me he wasn't going to be there. He said, and, and not only that, but uh, our minister of music got mad, and he's resigned. I didn't know that. And he said, not only that, but our secretary got mad, and she's resigned, and she won't be able to write you a check. Now, that really got my attention. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, have mercy. If I'd known all of that, I'd resign myself. <laughs> and they had this guy get up to sing, a visiting singer. I've never heard anything like it in my lifetime. He sounded like a hoot owl with a post-nasal drip. And I was sitting there, watching all of that unfold. And I looked out in the audience, there must have been about 40 people at the very most, and they looked like they's mad and out of fellowship. And I was sitting there listening to that guy sing that song, and I thought, Lord God, what am I doing here? And I began to thumb through my Bible to find the shortest devotional that I had. I said, Lord, I'm going to preach a little short devotional and I'll be back in time for the second half of the book. <laughs> but Brother Danny, as I sat on that platform, I did not hear a voice. I did not have some vision. But God breathed to my heart. I did not bring you over here tonight to evaluate this church. I brought you over here to scatter the seeds. Now you get up and you do what I told you to do. And I stood and preached a little old simple sermon that probably insulted the angels of God. But when the invitation was given, seven grown people were saved. And I said, God, could it be that you know a little bit more about this than I do? <laughs> My dear young brother, listen to me. God didn't call you to be an evaluator. God called you to be a proclaimer. And take this word and stand up where God told you to stand and preach what he told you to preach and let God be the author of who will and will not respond. Don't let the devil take away your seed by evaluation. But I've got to hurry. He takes it away by disqualification. Now I want you to listen very carefully. Paul said that he that runneth the race is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now we don't know exactly what that what meant. It might have been that the runner got in the wrong lane. He might have started prematurely. He might have hindered other runners that were around him. But whatever he did, he did something unlawful, and he lost the crown that he could have won. Now, fellas and ladies, listen to me. I wish I didn't have to say this. I wish that I didn't have to even remind you of this. But the chances are very high that there's somebody sitting in this building right here today that will end up disqualified. I hope that's not true. I suspect it is true. I was walking through the Birmingham airport the other day. 
As I walked down the car, there's a, a man ran up to me and hugged my neck and put his hands up on my face and said, Oh, Brother Junior, I'm so glad to see you again. I knew who he was. He was a pastor friend that I'd helped in numerous revivals. He was a wonderfully anointed man of God. And as we stood talking, he began to cry. He said, Brother Junior, I guess you know what happened to me, don't you? Well, yes, sir, I do. And I'm sorry, but I won't tell you I love you. I'm praying for you. And Brother Danny, he began to cry. He said, Brother Junior, God was blessing my church. We was running over a thousand. People were being saved, and my family was happy, and all. it was going so good. But he said, one day my secretary came in the office, and I found myself looking at her in a different way than I'd ever looked before. And he said, to make a long story short, I had an affair. And Brother Junior, I've lost my family. I've lost my church. I've lost my friends. I've lost my self-respect. He said, I feel like a walking dead man. A few days later, I was preaching at Southwestern Seminary, and I gave that story without any details much as to who he was as a warning to those students at Southwestern. Little did I know that that broadcast was being Skyped across the country. And somewhere up in Chicago, that pastor sat at his desk and watched that unfold. And he called me. Brother Junior, I heard you yesterday. And I thought I wish I could be there. I wish I could stand up before that congregation and say, he's talking about me. Listen, he's talking about me. And I thought, lost his family, lost his church, lost his friends, lost his self-respect. But far worse than it all, he lost his bag of seed. The seed that he should have been scattering now sits idly by while he shuffles paper in a brokerage firm. Oh, my dear brother, my dear sister, guard with every ounce of your energy, your integrity, and your character. You just have one, and if you ever lose it, you can never regain it. I've told people for many years, I prayed this prayer across my life. I said, God, if you know I'm going to get involved with somebody, would you please kill me before that ever happens? I believe, I say that with all my heart. I had a smart preacher the other day challenge me when I said that. He said, Brother Junior, if I knew I was going to get involved with some woman one day, I wouldn't pray God kill me. I'd pray God kill her. <laughs> well, whoever needs killing, let's pray that he'll do some killing. Don't let the devil... Take away your seed by disqualification. Now there's one other thing. Sometimes he does it by germination. You see, one of the devil's cleverest tricks is to get you to think when you sow that seed, it's going to come up in the morning. And that's why Paul gave this exhor exhortation to the believers. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. You know, Dr. Danny, one of the joys of getting old, if there is any joy in getting old, is that you are able to see things that you didn't see when they happened at first. I'm amazed that that happens so often. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been trying to maneuver through airports. I'm, uh, I'm in the final lapse of my ministry. I, as Dr. Falwell said, maybe overtime, I don't know. Uh, but I've been trying to maneuver through airports with bad legs. I have bad legs. I have difficulty getting up and down. Somebody said, uh, why, Brother Junior? I said, I've been in too many song services. 
Now, I want you kids to listen to me. If any of you are going to be ministering to music, I want you to hear me. I am writing a new book. I believe, Dr. Danny, that it's going to sell more copies than The Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> it's going to be one of the most popular books ever written in this day. Every senior adult in America is going to buy one of these books. You know the title of it? 100 Songs You Can Sing Sitting Down. <laughs> Did it ever occur to you that ministers of music and orthopedic surgeons may have some collusion among themselves? <laughs> now let's all stand an hour and a half and sing this little course. I about decided the next time that happens, I'm going to call the ministry of music up there when I stand to preach. Sir, would you come and stand right here? <laughs> And I'm going to preach about an hour and a half. And I'm going to say to him, don't you look like you're about to sit down. Now you stand up right there. <laughs> well, you know, of course, I'm joking you a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. <laughs> uh, but these old legs are sort of worn out, and I have to hobble along. And I was coming home from a revival the other day. And as always, I landed at the furthest gate from the, the terminal. It's always that way, Daddy. If I go out somewhere, I, I land up at 140 gate down there. And I was hobbling along and trying to get to the, the planing place and get in my car. And I, I, just, I was thinking, Lord, I've been doing this 58 years. I'm tired. I'm weary. My old legs are worn out. God, maybe it's time to hang it up. And I came to the steps going down to the greeting area where everybody's waiting for people on the plane. I knew there wasn't anybody there to meet me. I parked in the car, so I was alone. And so I made my way down the steps and was getting ready to walk out to the parking lot to get in my car. And I heard somebody call my name. Brother Hill. Brother Hill. And I turned and a little blonde haired lady with two little children by her side ran up to me and said, are you Junior Hill? Yes, ma'am. I am. Oh, Brother Junior, I love you so much. I said, ma'am, do I know you? <laughs> She said, probably not. But she said, 20 years ago, you came to the Shades Mountain Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I was a little eight-year-old girl, and you preached, and I got saved. And my husband and I are on the mission field, and I'm waiting here for him to get off the plane. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir for being faithful to tell the gospel. And I said, well, glory to God. Maybe I don't need to retire. Maybe I just need to retread. 